Hello, and thank you for joining us here today at BPC's J. Ronald Terwilliger Center for Housing Policy. I'm Owen Minot, Associate Director of Housing and Infrastructure here at BPC. Today, we'll be discussing neighborhoods of opportunity. Often, when we talk about housing policy, we're talking about how to expand access to affordable homes. But where those homes are and the communities that households live in play an enormous role in shaping outcomes related to income and health. Unfortunately, neighborhoods with the greatest economic opportunities are often out of reach for low-income Americans. As we'll hear more about in a minute, giving low-income families the option to move to these high-opportunity neighborhoods is a proven way to increase economic mobility. Just to give you an outline of our programming today, First, we'll have a brief presentation to provide some context for this topic, followed by a panel discussion to explore these issues in depth and to highlight how these insights can inform federal policy. If you're watching live today, please submit any questions you have at any time, and you can post them in the chat if you're watching on YouTube. So now let me introduce our presenter. Sarah Oppenheimer is the Executive Director of Opportunity Insights an initiative based at Harvard University that conducts research on how to improve upward mobility and how to translate findings into policy change. Prior to her time at OI, she served as the Director of Research and Evaluation for the King County Housing Authority and led cross-sector research at the Harvard School of Public Health's Division of Public Health Practice. So with that, Sarah, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Owen. This is such an exciting group to be speaking with today and on such an important topic. Um, as you mentioned, Opportunity Insights, or OI, is a research and policy center at Harvard. We use big data from government as well as private sector sources to study economic mobility and opportunity in the United States to better understand what the patterns are, and then most importantly, what we can do to improve economic opportunity. And so to provide some context for the rest of the conversation today, I'm hoping to spend just a few minutes setting the stage around what we know about neighborhoods and mobility, as well as what we're learning are effective ways to increase neighborhood choice. Okay, great. Wanted to make sure my slides are advancing. So one of the ways that we're really able to leverage big data at, as a, at OI is to get a sense of how opportunity varies by geography. And so this map of the United States has become very much a foundation of our work at Opportunity Insights. It uses millions of linked census and tax return records to show how mobility varies enormously across the country. And so this particular map shows the average earnings for children who grew up in low-income households. So these were households earning around $27,000 per year based on the area that they grew up in. And so you can see in some places, the areas that are shaded in blue and green on the map, places like Salt Lake City, San Francisco, Dubuque, Iowa, these children had greater upward mobility as adults whereas children who had grown up in similarly low-income households in the red and orange shaded areas, so places that you can see on the map in the Southwest, the Southeast, and other places across the country were more likely to grow up to earn the same amount as their parents, or in some places even um, experience downward mobility. Now, one of the benefits of having this vast big data set is that we can see that not only these variations, how they apply at the county level, but that they're also evident at much smaller geographies down to the neighborhood level. And so this is a close up of census tracts in the Seattle and King County area. It's based on the same color scale. And you can see that there are neighborhoods that are very, very close to one another that have very different outcomes for children who grew up there. And so, for instance, you can see that there are some spaces in South County where kids who grew up in some of those blue shaded areas went on to have average adult earnings upward of $47,000 compared to kids who grew up in neighborhoods just adjacent to that and went on to have earnings that were just around $30,000. And so these two maps really illustrate the first fact about what we know about neighborhoods and economic opportunity, that children's prospects for upward mobility vary substantially across different neighborhoods in the country. 
Now, the second fact is that moving to better neighborhoods earlier in childhood improves kids' outcomes in adulthood significantly. And so our prior research has shown that moving from a lower to a higher opportunity neighborhood at birth is projected to increase a child's annual lifetime earnings of around two, by around $200,000. This slide shows results from a number of different studies, both within the United States, as well as internationally, both from OI, as well as from other researchers. And it shows that the earlier a child moves to a higher opportunity or a lower poverty community, the greater the effect on their income in later life. But the third fact that we know about neighborhoods and opportunity is that low-income families, including low-income families who are receiving federal housing support in the form of housing vouchers or other forms, predominantly live in low opportunity areas. And so this is the same map of the Seattle area that I showed earlier, but we've overlaid in green dots the most common location for families who are receiving a housing choice voucher. And you can see that as of 2015, 16, 17, these dots were disproportionately in those red and orange shaded lower opportunity areas. And this pattern that we see or saw in Seattle is not unlike patterns across the country. Although the voucher program and other affordable housing um, policies are in theory designed to give families access to all neighborhoods, we continue to see a consistent pattern where families who are receiving subsidies are concentrated in lower opportunity areas. Um, additional research that we've, do shown, what, that we've done shows that it's not just differences in rent or in housing supply that ex can explain why low-income families live in lower opportunity areas. And so given these facts, there's a broader policy question as to what really gets in the way of families moving to opportunity areas and what can we do about it? And so to help answer this in 2017, Opportunity Insights partnered with the Seattle and King County Housing Authorities, as well as with MDRC, JPAL and others to launch a randomized controlled trial, creating moves to opportunity or CMTO to understand how a suite of support services could affect where families who are receiving a housing voucher decided to move to. Now, certainly CMTO was not the first of its kind. Um, in many ways, it built on numerous learnings from earlier mobility programs in Baltimore, in Chicago, and a host of other places. There were a few key sort of notable elements to CMTO that are worth noting now. One is that we randomized participants who participated in the program. These were families that were coming into the voucher for the first time and were assigned to either just receive the voucher or receive the voucher plus services. And randomizing that way could give us a very accurate picture of what works. The other was that families were not required to move to certain communities with their voucher, which was different some, than some prior mobility programs that really constrained the voucher to only be used in certain neighborhoods. So the CMTO services included three different components um, that were all provided by a team of outside housing navigators. The first was customized search assistance for families where navigators would work with families to provide education and tours of high opportunity areas, provided direct rental application coaching, um, as well as housing locator sort of brokering services. The second was that navigators um, uh, engaged in direct engagement with landlords, with, where they built relationships with landlords, recruited them to participate in the voucher program, could help to expedite lease-up processes between the landlord and the housing authority, and also provided an insurance fund to mitigate against any damages that might come up. And then the third area was that families um, were provided with the option of short-term and flexible financial assistance to help defray move-in expenses, such as application fees or security deposits. And so the average program cost came to just under two, or just under $2,700 per voucher. Now this varied by family, but on average, this was a fairly affordable, scalable intervention. So what did we find? So you can see in the teal bar, this is the um, opportunity move rates for families that received services compared to families in the control group who did, only who did not receive services who were in the gray bar there. And you can see that 53% of families who received those services plus the voucher moved to high opportunity areas compared to just 15% of families who received the voucher alone. And although we had hoped to see some impacts from the program, these results frankly blew us away. Um, they were definitely at a magnitude above and beyond what we were expecting to see. 
But from a policy perspective and a scaling perspective, we also wanted to know if we scaled back services, could we see impacts could, that, that were at that same level? Could we see sort of policy change that worked just as well? And so we went on to run a second phase of the CMTO trial. This time we assigned families to one of four groups. We continued to have the comprehensive services group and a control group, but then we added in two new groups. Um, so a group that's in the purple bar there that assigned families to just receive the financial services alone, and then the orange bar there, which was families who were assigned to a third treatment group to receive sort of a paired back version of both the financial assistance and the services. And you can see this bar chart again shows the proportion of families who were assigned to any of these groups who moved to high opportunity areas. And you can see that the, um, that although families who were assigned to receive that sort of full suite of services continued to move to opportunity areas at the same rate that we had seen in phase one, around 53% of those families moved to opportunity areas, a much smaller proportion um, in the sort of two scaled back treatment arms moved to opportunity areas. And I think really showed that there was something particularly effective about that full suite of customized support services that really enhanced the voucher program and really ultimately leveraged this tremendous uh, program in fully supporting kids' long-term outcomes, really being a lever towards long-term economic mobility. So lastly, one of the other unique aspects of CMTO that the study included was a large qualitative dimension to really elevate feedback from families and from service providers. And this really allowed us to get a clearer picture of the specific mechanisms that seemed to be most important to families. Why did this intervention work? And so the quotes here are from families really illustrating the experiences in the program. You can see in the teal at the top, Jackie noted the importance of the emotional support that was provided by navigators. Um, saying that it was this whole flood of relief. Leah spoke about her experience having navigators assist her with landlord brokering, saying the navigator said, I'll come to you, we'll help you to fill out the application, we'll help you talk to the landlord. And then finally, Jennifer at the bottom there explained in, in the context of receiving financial assistance that they really understood the, assist, the situation that she was in and why having these flexible financial um, supports was important for move-in. Now, I think that as much as it's so exciting um, to see these results from CMTO, it's obviously just one trial. It's in one particular location. And so I think sort of cresting into some of the other things we'll talk about today, it's exciting to see how in light of these results, CMTO evidence is being incorporated into some broader policy efforts. There's HUD's community choice demonstration, which began two years ago and is now being implement in, is implementing mobility services largely based on the CMTO model and what we learned there in nine different communities across the country. That's really going to help us understand how these approaches generalize to other places that have housing markets and community needs and policy landscapes very different from Seattle's. The other is movement that we're seeing on bipartisan sponsored legislation, the Family Stability and Opportunity Vouchers Act, the Choice and Affordable Housing Act, and other, um, I think, housing, uh, bipartisan sponsored housing uh, policy that is um, coming down the pike that will directly increase resources for mobility within the voucher program. And so with that, I'm going to close so that we can get to the broader conversation. I know I flew through much of this, so I also just want to note that all of these research studies, including non-technical summaries and fact, sheet, fact sheets about CMTO, about our work on neighborhoods, about other related areas, can be found on OI's website. Um, you can also access the Opportunity Atlas from our website, which is an open access data tool where you can go in and explore what economic mobility looks like across every neighborhood and every community in the country. So with that, Owen, I'll pass this back to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah, for that really helpful background for our conversation. Uh, now let me introduce our panelists who will be joining Sarah. Uh, we have Brian Samuels, who is the Executive Director of Chapin Hall at the University of Chicago. Chapin Hall is an independent policy research center that provides public and private decision makers with research and solutions to support them in improving the lives of children, families, and communities. And previously, Samuels was the Commissioner of the Administration on Children, Youth, and Families at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Andrea Jurasek is the Director of Fair Housing and Public Housing Revisioning at Enterprise Community Partners. And prior to her time at Enterprise, 
She was the executive director of Housing Choice Partners in Chicago, uh, leading the organization's housing mobility, rental support, and policy advocacy programs. And lastly, Andrea Gift Allen is the managing director of real estate at Predium, which is an investment firm with a portfolio of rental houses. And there she leads the firm's affordable housing investments across the US. Previously, Andrea spent more than a decade at Goldman Sachs, most recently serving as the managing director and chief operating officer of the Urban Investment Group. Just want to remind everyone in the audience, if you have any questions, uh, please post those in the uh, chat on YouTube. Um, so with that, thank you all for joining us and we can dive into our discussion. Um, so Brian, I, I want to start with you. Can can you speak a little bit about the work and mission of Chapman Hall and how it relates to opportunity for, for young people? Sure. Um, so, so Chapin Hall uh, is a policy research center um, that also extends its support uh, using implementation science. So we partner with public agencies across the country uh, to help them make better policy decisions, but also to make sure that when they make the right decision, uh, um, that decision achieves its intended outcome um, by making sure that the policy is implemented um, effectively. Uh, we primarily focus on work in the child welfare system. Uh, we do work in the runaway and homeless youth space, um, as well as the juvenile justice um, system. Um, as you can imagine, each of those systems um, have uh, different parameters, uh, but all of them also need to be able to deliver direct services to families in order to affect outcomes. So we also work in the community space of really um, evaluating effective interventions at the community level, as well as looking at community collaboratives to see how services can be blended and mixed in ways that are supportive um, to families. Um, the, the mission itself is really um, driving better policymaking. And so uh, while we don't specifically study housing, we do look at the issues of the role that housing plays in the populations um, that, that we work with. So for example, um, in the runaway and homeless youth space, uh, we, we test uh, programs and policies uh, to understand what access to housing does for young people um, who are experiencing housing instability um, or who are literally uh, um, homeless. Uh, and so uh, in New York City, uh, we're uh, testing a direct cash transfer program where young people are provided um, resources to be able to go into the private market, uh, sometimes join with other young people uh, and rent an apartment. Uh, and in addition to that work, um, they also have access to other supportive services. So it's not exactly permanent and supportive housing. It's not exactly supportive housing, but for this age group that's much more mobile, um, that may in fact choose to configure and reconfigure who they sleep with and sleep near, uh, um, and to, to leverage the, the flexibility of giving cash rather than a voucher increases the likelihood that they can um, get to get to housing sooner. Um, so in in New York City, obviously, um, there's limited housing. Housing is expensive, and often there are far more vouchers available than there are places to use those vouchers. So we're using this direct cash transfer program to really look at, can we get to better outcomes for young people facilitated by their using resources uh, um, to, directly, to directly engage in the private market around high housing? Um, another example just quickly would be in the work that we're doing in the child welfare space, where we know that um, the most reliable predictors um, of child welfare involvement are the loss of income, cumulative uh, material hardship, um, or housing. Uh, and so we are working with um, a number of states to help them think through um, how they intervene more effectively um, earlier in the life of a family uh, to ensure 
uh, um, that the stable housing produces the outcome of those families never showing up at the front door of the child welfare systems itself. Uh, there was one study recently that found the, that if a family uh, um, uh, found themselves in a homeless shelter, they were 12 times more likely to also then be involved in the child welfare system. Uh, so in the example that I just gave you, folks are really trying to figure out how to move upstream, uh, intervene effectively, giving families the support that they need and reducing the likelihood uh, uh, that they come to the child welfare system. So uh, much of what we'll talk about today from the Chapin Hall perspective really does reflect um, our working more closely with these public systems and realizing that housing is an essential element uh, to any policy solution for the most vulnerable families. Great. Um, Andrea Jurasek, I, I want to turn to you. Uh, in addition to your role at Enterprise, you also sit on the board of Mobility Works, which is a national organization dedicated to supporting moves from under-resourced communities to high opportunity neighborhoods, a lot like what we're talking about. I'm curious, what compelling evidence have you seen in your career or, or firsthand in research about the power of providing opportunities for low-income families to move to higher opportunity communities? Um, yeah, as Sarah and Brian touched on, I think there's been uh, plenty of research over the years showing that where you live directly impacts your life outcomes, especially for families with lower wealth and financial flexibility. Um, Opportunity Insights, um, their Seattle projects, and then also, of course, even demonstrations like moving to work, I'm sorry, moving to Opportunity, um, showed long-term positive financial gains for families uh, who moved through that program. So I think some of the most compelling evidence that I've seen um, has come from the Seattle, Seattle demonstration from Opportunity Insights. As Sarah touched on, um, in particular, the evidence underlying the power of one-on-one -on -one and emotional supports for families. Um, and we've seen this in Chicago as well at my previous organization, um, running the Chicago Housing Authority's mobility program, but um, navigating the voucher program and renting with a voucher can be incredibly difficult for uh, so many participants. And so having someone who can help communicate with landlords, explore new neighborhoods, um, et cetera, seems to really have a, a powerful impact on program participants. Um, to that point, I also think it's important to have housing navigators that represent the voucher participants that they're working with um, and uh, to, to really help foster that, that sense of support even further. Um, so yeah, uh, anecdotally um, here in Chicagoland, I've heard from hundreds of families who have moved utilizing mobility counseling program supports um, who felt that they and their children overall had a better quality of life um, after they moved. Um, a lot of discussion about stress levels, emotional support, things like that. Um, and uh, especially once they were able to get to know their their neighbors and, and their neighborhood. So ultimately, I think it, it really comes down to um, making sure households can have a fully informed choice of where they want to live and um, know the full val value of their voucher in terms of what it can provide access to. Absolutely. Um, and, and sticking with you, Andrea, um, you also lead Enterprises Fair Housing Work. Um, could you talk about fair housing protections and the challenges that low-income families and, and families of color face when searching for and securing housing in neighborhoods of opportunity? Yeah, um, you know, source of income discrimination or discrimination because a, a household is renting with a voucher um, is still incredibly prevalent, even in areas with um, source of income protections on the books. Um, so I, I do think that focus on enforcement of local um, or state protections regarding source of income uh, discrimination is incredibly important. Um, and also, I think, supporting the, the federal policies that are now being introduced that Sarah had mentioned as well. Um, you know, racial discrimination is still a very real challenge for families um, and something we need to be conscious of in racially segregated areas, um, especially in terms of how opportunity, quote unquote, or mobility areas are defined. Um, you know, one, one downfall <clears throat> to a lot of discussions can be around um, 
or a lot of programs can be around defining opportunity areas as primarily white neighborhoods and for a black family with a voucher that can uh, you know, be an incredibly difficult situation to navigate depending on, on the context. But so just being conscious of that and the local kind of um, conditions, I guess you could say at that level is important. So. Interesting. And, and just as one more quick follow-up, um, have you seen any communities using mo mobility programs to, to meet fair housing goals? Or, or if not, do you think that would be a, a good strategy? Yeah, I think um, especially with the new proposed affirmatively furthering fair housing rule, we'll start seeing more programs come up. Um, but the the dis and with that, I mean the discussion around mobility programs is really moving to um, the fact that they're part of a both and solution of uh, making sure that folks have you know uh, access to community amenities and investments regardless of where they live. And so um, we do see communities across the United States starting to think about or, or implementing mobility programs as part of that both and solution. Great, I wanna to turn to our other Andrea now, Andrea Gift Allen. Um, as a leader for Fredium's affordable housing investments, I understand you are working to develop and expand the firm's affordable housing portfolio for tenants who receive rental assistance through the voucher program. And you also work in partnership with the affordable housing team at Progress Residential, which is your single family rental property management platform. So uh, with that background, I'm, I'm just curious, based on your work at Predium, what does a high opportunity neighborhood look like to you? As Sarah described in her, her opening, um... Uh, a high opportunity neighborhood really increases the opportunity for upward mobility for our residents. Um, in defining those neighborhoods, we look to research um, and we also look to our public partners. And what I mean by that is looking to our local public housing authorities where we have homes. Um, some of the neighborhood characteristics that we evaluate include the poverty rate, um, the income relative to the broader metro area, the quality of the schools and the overall safety of the neighborhoods. Great. And um, I'm curious how Opportunity Insights research resonates with the work you're doing at Predium. Can, can you speak about the role affordable single family rentals can play in providing housing for, for voucher families in, in high opportunity neighborhoods? Yeah, the Opportunity Insights research certainly resonates with our work. We are investing in homes and neighborhoods of opportunity where the rents are affordable to housing choice voucher holders. That typically occurs where our public housing authorities um, are using um, our, um, where the, uh, where our public housing authority partners are using small area fair market rents or using exception payment standards to facilitate mobility to those neighborhoods. And so that is how they're making market rents in those areas affordable to housing choice voucher holders. Um, by investing in single family rental homes in neighborhoods of opportunity, we are able to provide housing choice voucher holders the choice to seek that greater upward mobility um, that is available in those neighborhoods. Great, um, so I wanna open up this next question to everyone, but um, so, so research like the work at OI has shed light on the value of opening pathways to high opportunity neighborhoods. And, and that's garnered a lot of national attention. Um, and we mentioned, if, you know, um, some demonstration programs and some early um, policy decisions, but it seems as though federal policymakers have yet to fully act on these findings and truly align our federal housing programs to support housing mobility. So I'm, I'm curious whether anyone has any changes they think should be made to the, the Housing Choice Voucher Program uh, to facilitate greater access to, to high opportunity neighborhoods? Um, I, I Just from experience working with a mobility program and with landlords across the U.S., um, I think that, you know, one of the things that we hear the most um, is that the program is just so difficult to navigate and it can take so long for 
um, a unit to be leased with a voucher because of the administration um, that are the administration of the program itself. And so, you know, I love that um, Chapin Hall is taking on some new opportunities to um, create uh, direct to tenant or direct to uh, individual subsidies. Um, I think that that is something that really can be explored more in the voucher program. Mm -hmm. um, Keen housing uh, in uh, Keene, New Hampshire has a really great, I think, uh, um, model program of that. Um, but just overall streamlining the administrative processes for leasing with a voucher, um, which I understand HUD is, is looking at now, um, really, you know, what ways they can um, sort of, uh, you know, stream, streamline and, and make more efficient the leasing process itself. Um, whether that's through the new Inspire um, inspection processes or um, calculating uh, fair market rents differently so that they're more attuned to current markets as opposed to retroactive based on uh, official census data or other data. Um, I think that there's a number of ways that, that we can look at it. And another point that I would add to that is that today it requires a lot of weight of legwork for property owners to confirm that their housing can be affordably rented by a housing choice voucher holder. Um, and HUD could help speed that process by creating and providing access to a central database of the payment standards, which is and the utility allowances, which determines that maximum affordable rent um, for a housing choice voucher holder. I would just add, I agree so much with both of those points um, and, you know, think that the, the voucher program, not unlike other uh, federal policies and programs, we're really learning how administrative burdens are sort of layered into that, both from participant standpoint, as well as in this case, from landlord perspective. And where can we use technology? Where can we use families, you know, feedback from families and landlords own experiences to really streamline some of those processes and how the program is currently set up? I think the other sort of fact of the matter is there's certainly spaces where we can improve upon how the voucher program is run and to Brian's point, how we can sort of put more resources in families' hands to use in less onerous ways than perhaps the voucher program is set up. And right now, only one in four families who are otherwise eligible to receive the voucher actually get it. And even before they get to the point of receiving the voucher, they're waiting on extremely long waiting lists, having to jump through many, many different hoops to get onto the right waiting lists or learn about what housing options are out there. And so by the time families get the voucher, oftentimes families will say, it's, I've won the golden ticket, but it's really just the beginning of their journey at that point on finding housing. And so I think to I think Brian's point or Andrea's, um, the more we can get sort of upstream and, and what the needs are and how we can be addressing things earlier on, the better I think we'll see downstream impacts that are really in accordance with the kind of long-term mobility outcomes are, these programs are um, intended to solve for. So, so one of the things that I would add to the conversation um, is uh, because of the tight market and the the there often being far more vouchers available than there are landlord landlords that are willing to uh, to rent uh, using the voucher um, is we we often think about uh, um, landlords that will accept vouchers as in and of themselves a good thing and we don't analyze uh, what happens in the context of those. Um, th that are accepting vouchers, and it's not uncommon, um, given the, the the that there's greater demand than there is supply, um, that even within uh, landlords that will accept vouchers, there's the real possibility of discrimination within that. So families with more children than others, families that bring other challenges with them, disabilities and other things. And so it's not just um, whether a landlord will rent and accept a voucher, but often it's also the question of um, how fairly um, they are uh, using that limited resource uh, in supporting families. And it's often the case that families that are struggling the most or would represent the most difficulties for a landlord is often um, the families that don't uh, uh, gain access to uh, what would otherwise be um, a property that would accept a, um, a voucher. So just, just another um, element um, to this conversation. Um, so 
one piece of legislation that Sarah actually mentioned in her presentation that we've been very supportive of at the Terwilliger Center is the Bipartisan Family Stability and Opportunity Vouchers Act. Uh, it was introduced by Senators Todd Young and Chris Van Hollen, and that would create 250,000 new housing mobility vouchers to allow families to move to areas with greater opportunity, and these families would benefit from a combination of rental assistance and services and support to help them thrive in neighborhoods with good schools, healthy environments, and, and accessible jobs. I'm just curious to hear um, what, what you all think about this bill, um, if you're familiar with it, um, and what do you think the impact of this, this legislation could be if it passed in Congress? I mean, I think it's it's great um, the way the the, the dedication of um, uh, Senators Young and Van Hollen I think has been wonderful to mobility over the years. Um, but with this uh, investment in vouchers, and you know, as Sarah mentioned, it is not considered um, an entitlement that they are very limited. And so, the more funding we can put into um, subsidies and supports for uh, families with lower wealth, I think is incredibly important. Um, and uh, I think it's in how the uh, the programs would be implemented, where the real questions will come in, um, what they will look like on the ground, um, how they can be customized to local markets, to local housing needs, um, and communities uh, uh, can really uh, make the biggest impact. So. Great. Um, so. Um... While we're just on um, sort of you know ways federal policy can can um, incorporate uh, the type of research we're talking about at OI, um, is there any other you know kind of research insights um, that you know federal policy should be considering um, as it you know tries to support uh, more more moves to opportunity for for low income communities and families? So um, my, my experience um, around working in the housing space goes back a long time ago, uh, almost two decades. I worked for a regional planning organization. Uh, and one of the um, uh, striking findings in the literature at that point was how important uh, uh, public transportation uh, is um, to people's mobility in terms of moving to new communities and still being able uh, um, to seek out jobs or to return to communities where, where they may have uh, resided in the past. And so I think thinking about um, moving to opportunities is also thinking about access to transportation um, as well as uh, uh, policies around where we build highways, where the highways go, uh, how accessible uh, communities are uh, for families that may want to relocate uh, um, but still have ties to job and other things. And so I think as, as we look at mobility, we have to keep in mind also uh, that they have to be accessible. And in this instance, uh, I'm talking about accessible in the form of transportation uh, uh, and public transportation, uh, uh, if possible. I think that's such a good point. I think two other things that I would add to that. So you know, one, um, Andrea spoke about some of the correlates of these opportunity areas, what constitutes an opportunity area. One additional um, correlate that we found early on that seemed to really contribute to some of these blue green areas on the map was this notion of social capital. And so we've subsequently really done quite a bit of research to better measure and understand what is social capital and how does that contribute to economic mobility. And what we find is that um, environments, schools, neighborhoods, other settings where that foster cross-class uh, relationships and connections between higher and lower income individuals seem to really be one of a, a major driver towards economic mobility. And so I think we're still, you know, fairly upstream in that research and not yet able to say these are policies X, Y, and Z. But I think thinking again around sort of what are some of the policies that um, contribute to both exposure as we think about it. So are higher and lower, lower income people in the same 
proximity to one another. And then the other major determinant that, determinant that we've seen in that work is what we call friending bias, sort of conditional on high and low income people being in the same places. Are they building meaningful relationships with one another? And the answer is no. In, in various places, that's not the case. And there is high friending bias. And so I think that opens up sort of a new dimension of policy to think about how education, community development, housing, a host of other policies are contributing to social capital and ways that we think will feed into economic mobility outcomes. The other um, point I was going to raise is, you know, ultimately, um, I, I hope that we don't look at the kind of maps I was showing earlier and don't put families in this position to say, do you want to move to opportunity or stay in a current place that may not be opportunity rich. Um, we know opportunity means so many different things to families. And it was really heartening to see that even families who didn't move to quote unquote high opportunity areas as part of CMTO still benefited from the kinds of conversations and agency that comes from working with a navigator in their move experience. Um, and I think that ultimately that sort of, I think begs the broader question, what do we do to help build or reinvest in opportunity in these areas that are red and orange on the map. That has been a much stickier research question to solve for, but one that we and others, I think, are actively working on so that we can understand how past place-based investments, as well as forward-looking policy um, on the place-based um, in the place-based setting, um, can really be as effective in um, supporting long-term mobility as we know moves to opportunity can be. So Sarah, that really kind of uh, is a good segue to what my next question is going to be about, which is that, like you said, it's not enough to just provide pathways for some people to move to to higher opportunity neighborhoods because not everyone is able to or even wants to leave their community. So um, as you were alluding to, what are some of the strategies or place-based policies that can help to build opportunity in neighborhoods that have not benefited from the same investments in schools or jobs or community assets. Um, does anyone have any any thoughts about that? So I I can give one example that that is pretty exciting, uh, and that's the the federal policy um, um, around what's called the Family First Prevention Services Act. Um, it was um, legislation that was passed back in. 2018, and states are really today uh, um, moving more closely to fully implementing the policy. The, the policy was really designed around the idea um, that you could move upstream uh, with uh, child welfare affected families um, and meet their needs earlier, um, as well as to prevent uh, their movement into the child welfare system. And so for the first time, the federal government um, actually gave states resources, entitlement funds, uh, um, that would allow them to provide services to families um, before they entered the child welfare system. Because prior to that, the largest portion of federal funding in child welfare was limited to only serving families after the child had been removed from the home. So this was to create balance between the prevention versus intervention um, uh, funds from the federal government. Um, but within that act, um, they have defined prevention uh, in a very broad manner. Uh, and so prevention today in the, under that act doesn't mean just at the front door of the child welfare system and preventing, but really being able to imagine going way upstream and start making investments in communities that, that creates the environment that people want to um, continue to live in. So for example, um, in, the four, in the first uh, um, 22 um, state plans that were approved by the federal government to implement the, this legislation, uh, 19 out of the 22 uh, included uh, home visiting uh, programs that were evidence-based, uh, which don't typically aren't provided through a child welfare agency. They're provided through uh, a behavioral health or an early childhood community uh, service provider. And so these are state these are states that are saying now they're gonna go to communities that might be disproportionately impacted um, by child welfare 
but make investments that, that come way early in the life of a family uh, and create the kind of community pathways that support families in ways that are really positive and constructive. So this act uh, provides prevention funds, which is exciting. Uh, it makes the funds flexible, which is exciting. Uh, and it includes language um, around community pathways, which is really the idea that there are a whole bunch of different ways in which families that gain access to services. Um, and these funds can actually be used um, to both support the direct service provision, but also to support the administrative functions necessary to actually coordinate services or do outreach or to make sure that families are aware of the available services in their community so that they can leverage and take advantage of them. So in this one act, um, wh while it is child welfare specific, uh, it presents this really unique opportunity to, to move upstream uh, to support families in the communities in which they come from uh, and to invest in evidence-based uh, programs so that across time, there's in increasing capacity uh, for communities uh, to provide a wholesome, positive environment uh, for families that don't have um, the mobility that others might have or simply choose to remain uh, in the community in which they they were born or have lived for a significant period of time. So I think it's one good example of the way a child welfare policy can pay dividends uh, from a community perspective uh, and still leverage an evidence base uh, in its approach. Great. Um, okay, oh, oh, continue, please. I was just gonna say another example, um, that I think we're working on right now, because I think one of the things we have learned um, over time is that sometimes we need to wait to see what happens with some of these policies. As Andrea was mentioning with the moving to opportunity demonstration, when we looked at an, uh, an initial results from that demonstration, they were somewhat mixed. When we went back and looked at sort of longitudinal outcomes after young children had moved as part of that, we saw these incredibly compelling results, right, in their adult outcomes. And so one area where we're sort of taking a similar lens and place-based is to look at what the longer term outcomes from the HOPE 6 redevelopment um, efforts have been, which is obviously has been a huge federal policy investment and where it, it sort of stands to reason we can look to see for young children that moved as part of HOPE 6, what were their longer term outcomes. So that's, I think, one area that will give us just more precision and detail into how some of those prior place-based policies worked and then what we can glean from that to apply then to contemporaneous place-based efforts like Choice Neighborhoods, Promise Neighborhoods, the Community Development Block Grant, some of these other major kind of policy investment areas that we can um, probably continue to borrow from evidence or get a stronger evidence base on to inform. Um, I also think it's important that uh, communities and decision makers uh, start looking to racial equity impact assessments for their decision making um, and including the communities that are going to be most impacted in that decision making um, to, to the level that's feasible. So, um, you know, the way that our communities have been shaped uh, is is due to very intentional policies throughout decades and generations. And I think it's gonna take uh, just as intentional, uh, that uh, just as an, a sense of intentionality to undo um, a lot of that and uh, to, to lead to more equitable distribution of resources throughout communities. Um, there's a model called the Place of Promise model. Um, we happen to be working with a, a community uh, in Louisville, uh, Kentucky. <laughs> that is uh, implementing that. And it's really about centering the, the residents of the neighborhood and uh, it, and the community in the, the decision-making and the investments that are brought into the community, so. I, I wanna um, return to some of the uh, challenges for housing mobility. Um, Andrea Gift-Allen, in, in your portfolio of affordable housing, um, do you have a sense of what are some of the major barriers that we have or haven't discussed facing low-income families that want to rent single-family homes in high-opportunity neighborhoods and, and are housing mobility programs well-designed for those, those barriers you see? Yes, as we've discussed today, the greatest barrier is in identifying a home to rent in high-opportunity neighborhoods. 
The first piece of that challenge is that research has found that nearly a third of neighborhoods across the country are rental deserts. And those places are commonly single family neighborhoods. Single family rentals offer residents the choice to live in those neighborhoods. Um, the second piece of the equation is an affordable rent um, and housing choice vouchers can provide that. Um, today, if you look across the country and at least in the markets that we're active in, you know, greater um, mobility to higher opportunity communities is occurring where the public housing authorities mobility programs are supporting the residents transition. Um, as we've also touched on today, um, the public housing authorities are setting payment standards that support market rents. They are timely processing applications, inspections, and rent renewals. This partnership helps both bring more housing providers to the table to provide housing choice voucher holders greater choice in homes and higher opportunity communities. And it enables us together with the public housing authorities to get families into homes quicker um, and to help stabilize them there. Great, we have a, actually a question from the audience I wanna get to um, from Josephine McNeil. Uh, she's asking, would the panelists talk about the attitude of residents of the opportunity communities to make new residents welcome and feel that they belong? Is, is that a, a challenge? Or are you seeing um, any hopeful or discouraging uh, trends in your experience um, with, with respect to that? Uh, yeah, I've seen it play out both ways um, where neighbors are incredibly um, welcoming and um, they are not, uh, to, to say the least. Um, so, I, I, you know, I think it depends on the situation, but, um, you know, I had somebody ask a question once about how do we prepare the new community, the receiving community members to have a voucher holder move in. And it was such an odd question because you don't do that with any other person moving into your community. Why would you do that with a voucher holder? So I do feel like overall, you know, it is it speaks to um, the social issue of whether it's racism or classism or what have you, but, um, you know, saying something when you see something kind of response, I think is good. And I think this is also where um, fair housing enforcement can really play a role. You know, neighbor to neighbor discrimination can be a fair housing uh, issue depending on the situation. So um, I, yeah, I think there's a number of ways to kind of look at that question. I agree. I think that, you know, another, I think two other sort of perspectives on it is, you know, from that social capital research that I was mentioning earlier, this is a win-win for all. Having sort of more um, cross-class connections is not just good for lower income communities and their mobility, it's good for everyone involved. And so there's sort of the compliance and enforcement areas that Andrea spoke to. And there's also, you know, this is, this is how to, I think this benefits everyone in the community. Um, I think that what we also saw with CMTO, and this I think gets back to this notion and the, and the evidence showing families' choices that we didn't see um, voucher holders picking just one or two neighborhoods. It wasn't that a neighborhood was all of a sudden inundated with voucher holders. And I think if we had seen that, it wouldn't have necessarily matched with the goals of the program. What we saw is that there was a really diffuse distribution of where folks chose to move, which makes sense. We all sort of have different inputs that we think about and where we want to move. And so in any given place, it just kind of added to the natural movement that people would see coming in and out of the rental and housing market in these communities. Anyway, I don't think that it really stood out as anything outside of the ordinary. Um, so uh, definitely, I think that there were conversations uh, along the considerations that Andrea is mentioning. But I think in reality, if programs are set up to really make sure that there is sufficient uh, supply in a lot of different places, we will see families move to a lot of different places. And that can be beneficial to all of those communities as a whole. We, we've spoken to some expert practitioners recently that have emphasized the importance of pairing mobility programs with financial education, job training, individualized coaching to help mobility program participants develop roots in those new neighborhoods and take advantage of the opportunities to provide that, that they provide. Um, is that something you think is, is a really, really critical component? Does anyone, can anyone speak a little bit about that? I think everybody should receive a financial uh, education and <laughs> investments, um, uh, regardless of their their place in life. But um, 
Yeah, you know, I think that they're they're definitely and, and uh, going back to opportunity insights and the CMTO project. I think um, you know the supports that were made available were were very well balanced and well 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 rounded, which we see in a lot of um, mobility uh, programs across the country. Um, I think it gets a little sticky when um, there are requirements for attendance in certain classes or um, you know seminars, things like that, uh, that families have to go through simply to get a voucher or to move um, or to remain part of the program. Um, we see sometimes, you know, housing authorities pairing a requirement for classes with, um, you know, the receipt of financial supports. Not everybody needs that, um, and not everybody uh, really wants to or has the opportunity or the the, the time, the, the the personal resources and capacity to go through that when they might simply uh, need a, a new community to live in and they know they want to move there. Um, so I think it's, you know, uh, kind of a, a, a bigger discussion um, on what's required, what should be required, what shouldn't be required, and who we're requiring things for and who we're not. So, yeah, I, I think. So th sorry, Brian, go ahead. Sorry, Emily. No. Um, I was just, I was just going to say that um, I think for a long time in this country, um, both housing policy um, uh, as well as policy related to, to social uh, um, services and other supports um, is it's often been the case that people um, have to earn the right to get something. So they have to earn getting their kids back from the child welfare system, or they have to demonstrate through effort that they're capable and ready to take advantage of a new housing opportunity. Um, and I think what's striking is the housing first research really has blown that idea out of the water that somehow you have to demonstrate efficacy in these following areas only then to get access to housing. And I think what we've learned there uh, is that that folks uh, can do more than one thing at the same time. Um, and that when given uh, sufficient opportunity, time and, and resources, um, can adjust to the environments that they relocate, ro relocate to, um, as well as where they where they choose to live uh, in the longer term. So I, I think these um, policies that rely on on demonstration of effort as proof that they have uh, skills and and efficacy, I think is is the wrong direction to go in and to point towards. Uh, um, more recent housing first findings that really suggest that um, folks when given sufficient stability uh, can take their own course towards being successful uh, um, when when provided housing. And I think you know we see that being culminated in some of the some of the details of, for instance, the Family Stability and Opportunity Vouchers Act. One of the reasons I'm such a fan of that bill is because the mobility services that are um, included in that, they're, I mean, they're customizable, right? I think what we learned from CMTO, what we've learned from a host of other programs that Brian and Andrea are talking about, I think families usually are the most expert in what they need, right? And we need to sort of set up an environment where families can tap into what they need in the easiest way possible. And so having services that are structured in customizable and flexible ways, um, I think will bring about that outcome more than requiring certain services along the way. Great. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time we have um, here at the Terwilliger Center. We are really committed to building economic opportunity through housing policy. So this is definitely something we will continue to focus on. But I want to thank you again to our guests for taking the time out of their busy schedules to chat with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. And, and thank you everyone who tuned in today. Take care and have a great rest of your day.